no red square though, it says it's recording though. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I am live here at the Mint 400 in Las Vegas, ready to head out to Prim tomorrow for, I don't know, what is this, like the 100 millionth episode of the Mint? I don't know, it's been around what for a while. What is it, 50 years? I, I mean, there was a gap there. There was a gap of like a couple of decades where there was no Mint, but yeah. I think it's like 50th anniversary was a year or so ago. Uh, it was yeah, a little bit ago, yeah. So I'm joined today, if you haven't <laughs> recognized the voice already, with the one and only Jim Beaver of the Jim Beaver Down and Dirty show. Is it the Dirty Show or the... Uh, we, we just literally in the last week changed the branding, something we've been working on, but... Um, it's just the Jim Beaver show now, General Tire Jim Beaver show. Gotcha, um, gotcha. It was down and dirty for 10 plus years. Say over 10 years. Yeah, it was just the branding didn't fit anymore because um, we're doing so much and we've got some celebrity friends and we're doing a lot of stuff with NHRA and IndyCar and so the, the title didn't quite fit gotcha, as gotcha. well. So, yeah. So, we're also joined by the one and only purple-headed dragon herself, <laughs> Brittany Cardone. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm just laughing. I'm listening to Jim, and in my head, he's talking about how the stuff's changed, and immediately I'm like, yeah, we're not quite as dirty anymore. <laughs> you, you got, you've moved up a level. Now you're in the actual trailer, in the tents. You're, you're staying pretty clean. That, honestly, from a branding standpoint, like if you look at everything in off-road, everything's dirt, dirty, right, something. Right, right. I appreciate side-by-side -side guys because it's like... <laughs> No, like literally it's pretty do, simple do, do, to what is going on. Like every media company, like print, um, audio, video, YouTube, like magazines, it's crazy. Like everything's got dirt in it. And I'm right. just like, this is, it's it's a branding nightmare. <laughs> I, I definitely can appreciate when someone has a very simple brand execution. It, it's something that makes me feel warm and stuff, fuzzy inside. So, yeah. um, so let's do a quick, we've had you on the podcast before. Yeah. So uh, many of our original listeners uh, will know you from that. If you're not familiar with uh, Jim, he's been covering uh, on Sirius FM for a long time, but even before that you were doing a lot of stuff and you've been in racing a long time. Let's do a quick rundown just for those that haven't been a part of the show or know where you're from. And then we'll move into uh, Brittany's uh, history as well. Yeah, um, so yeah, my family, uh, I grew up in off-road. My dad raced for, uh, you know, for 40 years and, uh, you know, in, in class eight, things like that. And uh, yeah, I've been racing for uh, about 20 years, uh, a little over 20 years. Uh, been doing, uh, um, yeah, I guess, radio, podcasting, you know, in and around off-road and motorsports for over a decade now. Do a lot of TV work. Um, I race uh, side-by-sides. Um, race trophy trucks before that, and um, yeah, and uh, we've got a uh, Brittany and I have a uh, marketing media consulting company, JB15, that uh, we do a lot of a uh, lot of work uh, in and around motorsports and power sports, and, and even more so with the UTV market recently with some of the new people you've signed on board, right? Yeah, we do. We're very heavy into the UTV space. Uh, we do do a lot in other stuff, but yeah, really heavy into the UTV and, space. And we talked a little bit of last time about the uh, the iRacing series, right? Yeah. How, how you guys I are. I forgot about that completely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've got our whole esports program too. So yeah, we've got a we've got an esports program. We have got some television shows on CBS Sports around uh, our esports stuff. Uh, we're one of 20 NASCAR franchises for eNASCAR. Uh, so we've got an agreement with NASCAR. Um, we field two cars in the eNASCAR series. So. so what does it take for somebody that's interested in that that kind of electronics version of real world racing to get into that? I mean, is that just anybody can jump in and, and do it? or Not, not a lot. That's what's so yeah. cool about it. And I think that's why it's gaining so much traction. Yeah. So can a one person just jump in and, and qualify yeah. as a racer and start racing? Yeah, you, you, they've got a tier. So like the eNASCAR series, I mean, you've got to put in time, qualify, and it's just like real world but um, in most of our events that air on television there's a qualification process to get into those stuff like right. that. that way somebody that just picks up a walmart steering wheel and pedals you know they don't go on a tv and just wreck and now do if you're not familiar with the that system they have a full like build out that you sit in to to race these things is that required or no or can you, you do you, it from a computer no i i've got We've got pictures of uh, Greg Biffle uh, on his yacht, <laughs> and he's, he's literally got uh, uh, like a Walmart steering wheel, some pedals on the floor. He's in a lawn chair, what, what and, he's got, and he's he got a laptop. What you're saying he can't do? What you're saying he can't do? He's done. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, so you you can yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I mean, you can start as basic as that, or I mean, I know people with thirty, forty thousand dollars sim rigs, you know, and they've right. got the motion ones now. And right. Like, well, so what we need to do is get Jim level. Bezos yeah. to go 
up into space and do it from space, and then that'll be, you know take you to the next yeah. to the next level. Um, so uh, we we know you've been in, in racing for a long time, uh, Brittany. Kind of where do you come from? Where do you fit into the picture? I, I don't want to say you don't. You're not normal in this scenario, but you, you said yourself, you're from behind the scenes most of the time, and, and you've kind of gotten a little bit more in front of the camera. What's your background? Where you come from? What have you done? Uh, I actually just sell shirts, so. <laughs> you know, it's a really important part of these events. Yeah. We got to have our merch. Right. Everyone, we're we're not selling shirts this weekend, though, so <laughs> she's failing. I, he's asked me for a, a bio, an official bio. I don't even have a business card. Because I, I, I can't that explain good. it. So you're just that good. I'm Everyone, you're high demand. Jim, no, see, that's the problem right there. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what I say; it's not going to come out right. So I'm going to make Jim explain. <laughs> oh, I got to give the intro. <laughs> hey, you're forcing me to do this. So yeah. This is part of it. <laughs> Otherwise, wait, I just wait a minute. Is this payback? Did something happen last week? <laughs> this is all part of a payback system. We always have payback with each other at this point. So. Um, no, Brittany, I mean, she grew up around power sports. Uh, her dad raced motorcycles. She grew up around, uh, yeah, power sports and, uh, and off-road in the industry. Um, she went to college at Arizona State. Her dad. Uh, I really feel like she should be saying yeah, this. Yeah, right no, now. I'm just like, it's so bizarre, but she wouldn't. She all, right, all, right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So, yes, I've, I've grown up around motorsports since I was three months old. I'm pretty sure my hearing is quite affected because of it, but that's all of us, so it's, it's right. great. Uh, other than that, yeah, so dirt has been my life, my entire life, and that's just been it. I actually am one of the few weird people that have a, a business background and degree and, and all that, so I kind of know a little bit on the actual functionalities of it beyond just, hey, I like <laughs> doing this and I want to do it for a right. living. So you so went to school for marketing or for I business? Actually, it, it, so Arizona State, is very cool. They actually have, oh, I think it's 40 different business degrees now. So you can't wow. just say, I don't know what I want to do. I'm going to go get a degree in business. Right. And you have to get an emphasis. So mine is actually a, a bachelor's of science. So it's not a, a typical arts degree. It's an, an actual science degree, which included a lot of math, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so I did get my degree. People at, underestimate the importance of math when it comes to racing. <laughs> oh, well, and, and we'll get to the other side of it where we, uh, my family owns uh, HCR Racing, which is a pretty popular suspension company. We're well aware of the quality products there. Yeah, yeah. so I, I did that for, what, 16 years. Long time. And when we sold the company, I was laughing because I, I did the math. I go, man, I've as long as I've lived, I've actually worked for HCR longer than I haven't. Right, right. <laughs> so that was a weird change. Jim actually uh, was one of my, my sponsorships that I dealt with. So I had known Jim for a decade on that side. And when he did the Polaris Star Car, we worked on a few projects together gotcha. and kind of built the UTV side. Because he goes, I know racing, I know this, I know whatever, but, you know, building this Polaris, doing this or that. And I laugh because... The first conversation we had, he goes, yeah, we're doing this, and I want to run your stuff. I go, no. <laughs> what do you, you mean, You got no? somebody for that. <laughs> I go, no. I'm like, if I'm not there and I'm not checking everything and I'm not doing whatever, like, we always joke, you're 700 miles into a race and something breaks. It's part of the attrition of racing. But if you're there on the side of the road, you can hand them apart. You're the one that got them to the finish. Right. If you're not there and somebody's not prepared and they don't have the right things or stuff happens, you're the one that took them out of the race. Yep. So doing something high profile, it's really cool to be a part of a lot of these programs. And that goes back to what Jim, for, you know, we do so many things. We also do athlete management for a handful of high profile athletes. We do brand consulting for a few manufacturers. So we're on the front lines and we're also behind the scenes and we see both sides of it. Uh, so it's, it's nice, but it's it's also interesting watching that dynamic, kind of what you were talking about with the production side of it. Right, right. Getting beyond just here we're out racing in the dirt and everybody likes to come and hang out. There's so much more to it that nobody realizes what goes on in the background. And you honestly forget sometimes. Right. Well, even we do. We get so focused on our niche of whatever we're doing yeah. that... You know, a lot of times uh, we talk about this community being so welcoming and and working together to accomplish these things, and then we get so focused on our own little niche that sometimes we do something and we're like, if we've been there, we think crap. Turn around, stop. Turn around. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean that. Let's do this. Let's fix this. Let's help you out. You know, whereas the rest of the community, a lot of times, all we see is the result. We don't see the work going into it, right? And so, uh, I always find it very interesting the stories that are to be had with the production crews, with the with the racers, with even just like you know, crew guys that are in the background, you know, guys that are running cables, just everyone has a part at these kind of a big events and these don't happen overnight with just somebody on a whim, right? 
and uh, I, I find it highly interesting just all the stories to be had there um, but uh, so we're at the mint uh, we're here in Las Vegas we are we have uh, trucks rolling around we got UTVs rolling around the tech uh, I think is pretty much over uh, most everybody's gone through uh, so that was a good time seeing all the cars out there we saw a lot of new the pro R's coming out a lot of those are gonna be on the course this uh, this uh, race uh, but speaking of razors You've recently came out with a big uh, change. Happened to be wearing the sweatshirt of a different company than usual. Uh, if you've been on online following things, we've shared the news and all that stuff. Yeah. But you've recently transitioned from Polaris to Kawasaki. Um, you know, how's that been going from such a dip? Such, I mean, it's a very similar platform in some aspects, but completely different uh, manufacturer and thought process and equipment and all that stuff. Uh, give us a little update on on how life is going to Cowie. Yeah, well, we're still, it's still kind of, it's still very new, you know, so we're still, uh, you know, working through things. Obviously, we've got a lot of transitioning because we've been, you know, we were with, uh, you know, Polaris for almost a decade. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been good. I mean, Kawasaki, the platform, the KRX is an amazing machine. Um, you know, and I, I've been, I truly mean this, they have the best naturally aspirated car on the market, you know. And so it's, uh, it's an amazing platform. The cars are uh, wicked, wicked in in the rocks and in the desert. And uh, so it's been fun. Um, you know, we've got some builds coming up and, and things like that. You know, honestly, just, uh, you know, driving something new for the first time in a long time has been uh, quite fun. You kind know? of refreshing, gives you a new perspective. It yeah. reminds you back to those roots where you're, you know, having to learn the machine and get one with the machine and, and all that stuff, which gets the juices flowing a little bit. I think that it's always a good time for me when someone else is like, hey, go drive the car, you know, check it out. It's like, first of all, you do the double check. You sure. <laughs> You, you then, almost don't have to learn with this car, though. But it's a great car. It, it, when we did a we did a, like a walk around review of the car when it first came out, and it was kind of like one of those things. Like it's like a Cadillac. You can you can jump in, and anybody can drive it and feel happy and have a great time, and not feel like they're having to work this machine or understand how a clutch works or understand how the belt's going to respond. It kind of just works. And I think that's the biggest thing. You know, it, we said this uh, in the interview earlier with Carson, but Kawasaki wasn't first to market, but they were best to market, and they really took their time and dialed it in. I mean, the theory, I mean, just the length, the width, they looked at every other car on the market and goes, all right, so what do people need? What do they want? Where are the gaps? How can we make this car better? And they did that. I mean, you don't lose belts in a KRX. You know, there's things like that. You just, I mean, they're they're very, you, you hate to say bulletproof because no side by side is bulletproof, but they're very, And we'll, you know, we'll all make sure it's reliable. not at some point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I don't know. That's the thing. We're sitting there talking to them about it. And what, was it a hundred? It was ten thousand, hundred thousand hours on a belt. Something insane. It was nuts. They were, like they were, they were trying to see how far they could take this belt, and they still had not broken it yet. They like, had one. It was a belt that had like ten thousand miles on it or something, and it was like still perfect. And I'm like, it's <laughs> silly how far tech has come. We people say that all the time. I'm sure. I think on the show that you just had, they were talking about technology in the cars and. But just even in compounds, right? You got to talk about rubber compounds. You talk about threading inside, and all these different things that people don't realize go into this development of these products. Um, you know, we've we've had belts with thousands of miles on them and no problems, right? People always complain, "Oh, I blew blow a belt every week on this car or whatever." It's like, well, you know, there are places where high performance cars will break components, right? They're, they're going to push to the limits and find the limits. But it's amazing how far the manufacturers have come. Especially like with the, the hydro clutch they got going on in these cars and, and how smooth it engages and, and holds and, and progresses. It's not, it's not the old school clutch that a lot of guys are familiar with, right? Um, so these cars are super smooth on accelerating and all that stuff. Now, when it comes to a race application, you know, what are you looking at going into figuring out how to make this car competitive for you to be inside of it and push it to its limits. <laughs> well, I think you look, I'm not looking for your secrets. I'm just looking at how you approach it. I think you approach it just like this car that you can't see on screen, but in Carson <laughs> Ornaments, I mean, right. you know, that car is in the last year, that's the most dominant car in UTV racing. I mean, he won, you know, in the NA class, he won pretty much everything he could win last year, you know, and, and out of the box car has been bulletproof. I mean, I think it, that's what you look at right there and, and do what Carson and Russ have done to that car because it's, it's amazing. And that's still an NA car. It's not been yeah. supercharged no, or anything. No, it's still an NA car, but he was competing for overalls in an NA car with it. So Right. And a lot of people don't really pay attention to that sometimes. They, they focus on this class thing where, you know, we're running pro turbo or running, you know, unlimited turbo or whatever. They don't really a lot of times give the credit to the NA guys. I mean, you look at some racers and, and like one of my favorite stories is just seeing how far like Kristen Matlock with Razor has gone. Right, and how she's dominated in Baja, and, and she's moving into the new Pro R platform this this week here at the Mint. 
Um, you know, NA is a really cool class just because it's so so it's such a raw horsepower. You're not worried. You're not having to worry about the turbo. You're not having to worry about some of these well, things. A whole lot less to go wrong. And there's it's a lot easier to keep the car running strong, right? So is is that car stretched or is that stock uh, wheelbase? Uh, no, that's stock uh, stock wheelbase. Yeah, and it looks like any I of mean, the other stretch I, well, cars out there. I say that, but sometimes with the arms they can add an extra inch or two yeah, yeah, yeah. or something. You know what I mean? So, but it's not like a four seater chopped no, or no, anything no, that's, like that. It's very close to stock. Yeah. Right. But but that's what's nice about them kind of sitting back and and watching and continuing development on it, and and not rushing to market because every little change they kind of watch who did what and why, and they followed those trends. And so that's, it's it's almost difficult to improve it out of the box. And it's interesting amazing. with Cowie just being that they come from the Terex history of side-by-sides, right? Where they're kind of more of this utility, kind of just the trail rider's car that they take out. Uh, and then all of a sudden, now that I don't know where they come out with a KRX, which is actually competitive at all the levels of the bigger cars that have been on the market for so long. Um, it really hasn't been much of a newsmaker just because it's so solid in what it does, right? It's not like it's failing all the time and, and then becoming a meme every week. It's not <laughs> it's not on fire on the trail, you know what I mean? Like it's not, it doesn't have something that makes a bunch of news around it, right? Yeah. It's just really solid, really capable, and people don't a lot of times pay attention to something that's not in the news all the time. So I'm excited to see Drama how it goes. Drama free. Drama free. Drama free, which in <laughs> racing world is, is gold, right? Yeah. If you're not having to worry about your car in, in a race program, I mean, that's almost like you're doing your job wrong because you're. <laughs> that's usually all you're doing is worrying about it, the car. It completely changes the strategy. Yeah. So on that checklist, when I actually co-drive for Jim when we're racing. And so a lot of the things... Uh, Which getting, is a talent, by the way. People don't understand how much of a talent it is to co-drive for someone to be in the passenger seat. It's a dynamic, and yeah. we've talked about that because there's been times where like, if the co-driver-driver dynamic isn't there, it's... But there's other times where we'll go 100 miles and not talk to each other other than call outs and this and that but we're in sync to where all of a sudden I get out of a trance and I'm like oh sorry <laughs> like, <laughs> we'll get on a straightaway or something I'm like oh hey because we're just we just get in this repetition you're sightseeing yeah we get it yeah that's that's it now, all you do Squirrel. is you, you just sit there at right rock right tree <laughs> dirt the third set of eyes right <laughs> so um speaking of that I mean going from a program in from from Razor to Kawasaki is there anything you're approaching different, or is it more of the same where you're just more focused on data sheets, pinpoints, like all no, that, that kind of that's stuff? That's what I'm saying. It's just that it's nice not having to worry about there's temp call outs, there's pushing the, the belt or the axles or whatever, because you're always chasing the weakest link. And what at what point we used to have that conversation all the time. Yeah, we can make this thing bulletproof. It's going to be a 4400 car at this point, or it's going to be a class one at this point. There's certain things you have to give and take. Right. And then it's, do you want a wear item, a maintenance item, or when it goes, do you want to blow the transmission or the diff? So right. you have to kind of pick and choose when you're building the vehicle of what you want to purposely be that weak link. And also pushing of, okay, we've got this vehicle, our split times are here. Where do we push? What terrain do we push? And we actually, uh, I, I kind of had a similar experience this season with, the tires, the, the general tires are amazing. And I was truly blown away. I've raced on almost every tire out there over the years. And there were certain things where he would jump into and I'd check up, slow down, don't push it so hard. We're going to blow a sidewall. And he'd laugh because he knew the capabilities. And I, I was still learning the tire at the time. So after the first or second race, I couldn't believe, like we'd talk to some people and they'd have eight, nine flats. Right. It wasn't, did you get a flat? It was how many? And we didn't get a single one. So it's like, it completely changed how I was able to, to push and focus on where we needed to slow down, where we need to check up during pre-running. It kind of changes it. It's, we knew where there's a certain rock pile where we're gonna fly past everyone because they're gonna have to slow down because they don't want to blow a tire or an axle or whatever. And so that all comes into play. And not having those factors or being able to eliminate those factors completely changes your strategy. Right. Now, when we start talking about a race car, uh, Kawasaki isn't a big technology leader per se in these cars. You know, Polaris has a lot of tech in their cars. Can-Am's trying to catch up a little bit with that. A lot of people are starting to adopt the three-click, the, the Fox IQS system, which Kawasaki now has on their car. Is that something that you bring into the race program, or do you consider that one more thing to fail and you just try to fine-tune that shock before you go out as an actual shock build versus a, an electronic system? You know, there's been some some people try the electronic system. I know even on trophy trucks, and I, it's a gr it's great for consumers. Uh, it's phenomenal for consumers. Um, but I think 
with the race applications, it's just, I, I don't know. It's Nobody's got it right yet who's tried to do it in a race application. I know, like, that's not even something I've considered, you know, on, on our race cars. Like you said, it's cost-benefit. Yeah. It's great. It's amazing technology, but it's no different than having power windows and power this and that and steering, and you get to a car at a certain point, and you go, okay, well, manual, it's just one more thing to break. And that's nothing on the technology, but right. it's exactly that is you have to weigh that out and say, what's the benefit and how close to you, is it 10%, 20% to make it worth it? But I think it's trending that way. Uh, four wheel drive trophy trucks, right? I mean, how long have they fought for that? And as of recent, it's now yeah, started, proven technology. Yeah, everybody's so starting to adopt it. It'll I, get there. I would say right now we're not looking at it, but I would say in the next five years you're going to have a good chunk of the new race cars all with electronics. That's kind of what I've been hearing from the, the discussions is that, you know, if you're not transitioning already, like your plan's not already in place, you're going to be behind quite quite soon. So I, I think we're trending that way, but I don't think it's quite there yet. Right. So um, the Mint 400, you know, this is a, a, a race just outside of Vegas and Prim. Uh, what can we expect out there on the race course? I heard a little bit about this course being faster this year, a little bit less technical. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to turn out, but it's pretty it, windy for sure. It, well, the wind's going to help on race day. Yeah. If there's, wind's good. <laughs> wind, wind's good for race cars, but I, it, it's the mint. You know what I mean? A little bit faster, yeah, but you you also have four laps. You're just beating the course up. It, it's, you know, faster, yes, but it's still the mint. It's still the same desert. It's going to get beat up. It's going to get rough. You're going to... A lot of carnage. I mean, everybody I talk to, you know, you you, you kind of you just there the first two laps and you push the last two laps. Save your car, then make right. a push toward. Make know. sure you finish. That's yeah, kind of a big part of it. You've seen year after year somebody lead the lead the first lap, lead the second lap. They're never there, there at the finish. They fall out of contention. They have a problem. They break. Right. So uh, this is four laps. How long are the laps? About an, are they are they yeah, over hundred or? Yeah, I think it's a little over hundred, right around there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a long race. I mean, that's not a, a quick jaunt out in the desert. Uh, that takes quite a bit of effort to keep your car in one piece, or at least pieces attached that work together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyone that you're looking forward to seeing uh, out here perform this week? Um, I mean, on the UTV side, obviously Carson, uh, uh, he, this was one of the few races he didn't win last year, so I think he's got a little chip on his shoulder. I think he's going to be really, really quick. Um, Obviously, it's going to be interesting to see with uh, with the new Pro R's. You know, if uh, Wayne and Kristen they've got their new cars, if they can get them sorted, and uh, you know what I mean. And I, I think I think what we've seen so far with the Pro R's is you know they, they've struggled, uh, but Guthrie struggled as well. You know what I mean with them, and uh, I think they're going to be once they get them sorted, they're going to be crazy fast. You know, it's just it's not a matter of if; it's when they get them sorted. So, right. um, you know, Kristen's got her brand new one, and I think. They literally just finished it, so yeah. uh, it's an interesting storyline to watch those. But um, you now, speaking of the Pro R, the weight of the car is a big deal, right? In, in the race application, you're always trying to balance your weight correctly, try to get your shocks and your weight and your and your front to back balance and all that stuff dialed, so that when you're going through whoops or the whatever, that you're not going to get out of control. Uh, how do you think that weight increase is going to be competitively in in this kind of scenario? Well, I mean, you look at the trophy trucks and their weight, things like that. You know, obviously, there's a weight increase of the cars, but you've also got a horsepower increase, you know. So I think, you know, that 230 horsepower overcome a lot of uh, weight deficiencies. So Right. Well, know. but it's putting a lot of weight in the back, right? Like, well, there's a lot of weight bias when you're talking about where to put your tire, where to put all the spare tools and all that stuff, right? Uh, but then all of a sudden, you're now introducing another 400, 500 pounds to the rear at the very, very back of it, right? So that kind of changes how you lay your car out and all those things. Uh, do you think it's going to be a factor, you know, this race season as, the, as they start to grow that that segment of the race market? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I know, th you know, these are, you know, these aren't just UTVs now. They're highly engineered race cars um, that we're racing. And I think, you know, th there's been a lot of thought and theory on placement and things like that. Obviously, you know, they've tuned the suspension so that it, it compensates for the weight differences, things like that. So, um, yeah, I definitely think it's, you know, it's something on a really rough course like this. Uh, something that could come into play. Um, you definitely really tough, rocky course. You want something a little bit lighter. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know that it's going to be that big of a deal. Yeah, so we, we look at the KRX, for example. When it first was announced, everyone was like, holy cow, that's that's a lot heavier than my, my 1000 Razor or my Honda Talon or whatever, right? And so they, they've already taken that into consideration with what they're building, big, bigger, beefier parts and, and all that. So it definitely comes down to prep and engineering, right? If you've got a team that understands the physics of these cars and, and can really dial these things in, 
uh, you know, there's some benefits and there's some negatives and, and you can overcome or, or play off of them. We, we don't plenty of fast cars that never make it to the finish line. Sure. And they're, they're light, they're fast. They got, what, they're tapped out, horsepower, but, t- everything. They never make it across the finish line. So, I mean, it's, it's a factor, yeah, but it, it's just one of the factors. It would be interesting though, like you're talking about as far as placement. Let's get pictures of the car now. On where Before got, and after? No, no, where they've got everything <laughs> set. And let's watch throughout the season. Let's see if stuff gets moved. Stuff let's moves see it. Just keep an eye placement. on it. Yeah, I'd just be curious to see if stuff moves or not or if it kind of stays there. Right. I feel like that will answer your question. That's true. We should we should definitely do a look back at the end of the season and kind of just look at how the cars look. That'd be yeah. really Where are really they now? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, what what else about the Mint makes it special? I mean, we were, we're in the middle of Las Vegas. We've done a downtown takeover. You know, there's cars doing tech on the streets. There's, you know, vendors out here for everyone to visit. Um, the the Mint's race course has spectating locations, which is an interesting thing. Where a lot of times when you do big desert race and there's nowhere to watch it, you know, they're gone. They're gone. You're not going to see anything, right? Um, you know, is there anything about the Mint that makes that different than other races? Nostalgia. The history, the history here, you know, there's a lot of history, you know, this is, uh, there's been movies about this race, you know. Um, so I think that's it, the history, the nostalgia, it's, it's one of the premier events. If you're a racer, this is one you want on the resume, I mean, 400 victory. I mean, it, right. It, 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 you know, it stands on its own two feet. So I think, you know, and it's just, I think the nostalgia, but the fact that it's just so ridiculously hard to win this race because it's so rough and beat up and rugged, you know, so I think there's, it's sense of accomplishment just to get to the finish line. Right. Uh, I've talked a little bit about this, like at Sandsport, right? Like Sandsport is such a big show that's evolved over the years from what it used to be, right? You mean the side-by-side super show? Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I mean. And, you know, it, it was such a cultural thing that had changed over time, but people's kids grew up in it going to it every year it became a family outing to go and do this thing right and i kind of feel like that's how the mint kind of plays it's in in the race scene how it plays its role is that it's this thing that everybody grew up seeing these 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 titans of off-road kind of conquer and then now they have the opportunity to buy the car themselves and go compete and it, it gets people excited it, well it's a destination race too right being here being on fremont having the street parade you know being able to to have contingency it, it's They've made it such an event where there's that much more. I know people that come out that never actually make it out to Prim and see the race cars. They right. come out for everything. They else. never leave Fremont. <laughs> right, right, for sure. But I mean, if you if you're a hardcore racer fan, you're going to want to get out and get dirty out on the course and, and see some of these cars. It's definitely a good one for spectating, for sure. Yeah, and make sure to bring your goggles. That's one of the number one tip I tell people is if you don't have goggles, bring your goggles because when the wind kicks up and the valley starts to get saturated, those will you'll be so happy you brought those. Um, so. Now that we have Brittany here, I have the opportunity to talk more like we talked on the last podcast, a little bit about racer inspiration, like how to get into the sport, how to chase sponsors, how to do some of this stuff. Um, Being on the business side of of a lot of this with Jim, um, are there any tips you can bring to the young racers that are getting into the sport? We're seeing a large influx of young people getting into UTVs to start their racing career. Um, as, as somebody that, as a group of, uh, a team that works to bring these racers up in the programs, what are some of the tips you guys have to get these people from just buying the car and putting some harnesses in the garage to, to competing at a level where you can actually win races like the Met? Don't, don't DM, check your spelling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no I, emojis. I'm, just, I'm just trying to, I, I mean, there's, I'm a fan of emojis, but there's a time and place <laughs> for it. It's just amazing professionalism. And I'm not even going to say young racers. It's generational or anything like that. It, it, anybody can get into it. And that's what's cool is, like you're saying, it starts as, hey, I like that. I want it. I've seen it. My friend's got one. I drove it. That was cool. I'm going to go purchase it. And then a lot of these smaller race series, you've watched them grow because of exactly that. All the weekend warriors. It's a family event. It, now my kid can get into it. And we're going to go do this and go out to works or go wherever. And so it's, I can take this factory car and now add this and add this and now it's race legal. Okay. Now I want to do that. Uh, one of the things just on, on actually just the build side is I've watched it so many times where somebody will start one direction and then they Change decide course. they want to chase a different series, but you, they have all these tech difficulties and requirements right so you basically have to rebuild a new car so kind of planning that out but it's providing value to the sponsors right there's a reason that you're getting something for free or they're paying you to do something so not just saying hey i like your stuff can i have it 
<laughs> Here's what we're doing, you know, who, what, where, when, why, providing right. any sort of strategy and taking the time. If you don't do your due diligence on a company before you, you show up, oh, CCing, that's always a good one too, right? Yeah. We see those all the time where we'll, we'll get some sort of multiple sponsors in one. And they'll, they'll CC and they've hit every manufacturer up on the same Yeah, they'll, they'll like publicly <laughs> CC everybody or they'll send a proposal that was for, From say, X to Y. So, so, <laughs> oh, wait, a proposal. Hold on. That's a whole separate thing. Yeah, but they'll send <laughs> something that's meant for Red Bull and they'll send it to Monster and forgot to copy and paste. Like, or to, it was a copy name, and paste. Yeah. Text replace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they exactly. forgot to replace the name and I'm like, oh my gosh. Don't you know? expect a manufacturer to take their time and invest in you if you're not going to invest in them. One of the things that I tell guys that always, that when we bring up the conversation of sponsorships and stuff like that is, is know just as much or more than the guy at the company about the product before you even ever ask to get involved with that part of the decision process. Like if you're gonna come and say, hey, we just need trailing arms for our car, can you sponsor them? How about you go to that sponsor and be like, hey, your guys' stuff is so awesome that I really want it on my car and this is why, because you guys have the best here, you do the best there, and I wanna make sure the best is represented on my car. And if they see that coming to them, right, they're not gonna be just sloughing you under the, the pile that they get every day. It's gonna be more like, well, what's this kid about? Why is he talking to me about you know these arms, right? And that might lead to other conversations and maybe they don't sponsor that, but maybe they are looking at you as far as you know other opportunities. So it's my We're original ACR watching. deal, right? I mean, she told her I'm gonna buy your parts. She goes, no, you're not. And I go, or, you know, I wanted them. And she goes, no. And I said, okay, I'm gonna buy them. And then she goes, okay. I go, but here's what you're going to do. I go, you need this, you need this, you got to upgrade to this, you're going to do it this way, Other, do it right or don't like, do it at yeah, all. And he goes, okay. And right. I wasn't used to that response. <laughs> Man, all right, I, I guess we're doing this then. And it, it worked out great, and I'm so glad. And what we've built and changed and everything since then, it's crazy to even go back to that conversation we had at, what was that, the Colorado Bell? <laughs> No. Uh, that was after that too, I think. Well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's when we put the game plan together. But it, it's that, and like I said, it, you got to invest in yourself to to have somebody else want to invest in you. Right. They have to see that you've already put in the time to make things move forward. But, but we're always watching, and that's what I was getting at. Is there's certain people that we see where there's everybody puts their budgets together, so we're already looking out a year or two. Right. We're already having conversations, planting that seed, building a relationship, not coming in cold calling somebody blind. You like somebody's stuff, buy it. See if you can get a discount on it. Do a racer program, then say, look, I've ran your stuff. I've already built this reputation with you guys. Can we take it to the next level? Building stepping stones really helps with manufacturers. So we are uh, about to wrap up here at the Mint with uh, Jim and Brittany. Uh, you guys sponsor, you're not sponsor, you run the programs for a number of athletes. Who should we be looking out for this year? What moves are being made uh, that we should be paying attention to? Uh, it's a weird year. I honestly, I can't answer that. It's just literally, this is a very weird year for the industry uh, across the board. A lot of people, including us, are doing stuff that uh, is a little bit out of the box, a lot of content. Um, you know, to say who to key in on, uh, you know, I really don't know. It's, you know, it's one of those, I think schedules aren't even set for most athletes at this point. A lot There's of contracts, been some changes in the, a lot in the of racing schedule too. A lot of contracts are signed from companies and it's, it's just, it's a crazy year. And I think, uh, you know, obviously coming out of the pandemic, the economy, obviously what's going on in the Ukraine isn't helping anything right now. It's, right. it's a weird year. So it's like to say who to watch out for. My answer today will be different tomorrow. Right. <laughs> yeah, let's let's revisit that question. No, no joke. Seriously, in like two months, let's re let's, let's revisit, revisit that. once the ball I'd be starts rolling. The yeah. yeah. Like like her and I have said, this is March. This is kind of this is kind of like January. Like this is like a January. The first. year hasn't started yet. No, the we're year really hasn't. Still stuck in if you ask corporations, it hasn't. Right. It's weird. And that's been the vibe I've been getting from yeah. a lot of people. So. Uh, where can we follow your guys' uh, athletes? Where can we follow you guys? Uh, How can we stalk Brittany and make fun of her hair? Um, <laughs> what, where can we can we reach out to you guys? Um, well, I'm... Uh, While Jim the big trucks start getting loud in the background. Yeah. We'll speak so over I'm, them. I'm Jim Beaver 15. She's B Cardone 15 on uh, social. And then uh, we've got uh, JB15 group. And then uh, Jim Beaver show on Instagram as well. So... So if you uh, subscribe to Sirius Radio, you can check out the Jim Beaver Show. Uh, you are on weekly, right? Uh, Saturdays and Sundays, uh, two, uh, Sirius XM 217. Um, and and then, then you also have it as a as a podcast. It's on a podcast, yep. Apple Podcasts. Go subscribe there. Um, obviously, our website, jimbeaver15.com. Um, and then we're also you know on the U.S. American Forces Network, uh, a bunch of AM, FM networks. But... Awesome. Well, I uh, look forward to the show. I know, Britt, you got a lot of stuff you're doing 
for the show in the background, and I look forward to seeing you know kind of everything come together over the next 24 hours, or I guess I probably not even that, probably eight hours. <laughs> well, we'll get you a sneak peek, right? We're already talking about that, so we'll, we'll um, touch back on the text. And you're going to be doing some announcing and stuff like that too, right? Yeah, I'll be doing the hosting live stream uh, tomorrow and Saturday, and uh, Brittany will be working uh, behind the scenes on the live stream also. So. Sounds good. All right, guys. Well, that's it for this episode. You can find us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, all the different places along with uh, YouTube, and you can see all of our funny faces and Brittany's <laughs> hair color. So check us out online. See us next time. Peace. 